Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good afternoon everyone. This is Lisa White, CML's Membership Services Manager. Hope everyone's having a great day and a wonderful start to the afternoon. We have a wonderful webinar scheduled today to help give you all of this wonderful information you need, canceling an election and signature verification. Okay. So um, most of you have been on webinars before, and for that, we totally appreciate it. But I do want to remind you that if you're not familiar with the format, you'll see a control panel to the top right of the screen. You have an orange arrow to the left of the panel, which will minimize that box. We will be muting all of you for the webinar, but we do ask that you ask questions by typing them into the question box in the control panel. We'll take all questions at the end, but feel free to put in the questions when you think of them. A couple of quick things, um, just a heads up that this webinar may be just slightly longer than an hour, lots of information to cover. Karen has said that she's got a lot of information to share with you, so don't be surprised if we do last a little longer than an hour. Um, another reminder that we are recording this and we will post it to cml.org under training materials. So if you miss something or if you want to watch it again or if you have a colleague that you think may be interested, you'll be able to just click right on it or forward them the link to do that. Another reminder, um, just FYI, these webinars we've been doing for preparation for the spring 2018 elections, they are part of a series. But we do ask that you uh, register for each one individually to make sure that you get that individual um, instructions to participate. And just a reminder that even though they're free, we do ask that you continue all the way through the process till you get to the Place My Order button. And then you'll see on the screen it says, thank you for placing the order on the CML site, just to make sure that it all goes through and you get the information you need. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Karen Goldman, who I don't even think needs an introduction. No. She's our Municipal Clerk Advisor Program Consultant and an election guru. So handing it over. Thanks again for participating. Thank you, Lisa. Hello and welcome, everybody. It is a sunny day here in the Denver area, which is quite a difference from what it looked like yesterday. Still cold, but then it is winter. And Happy New Year to all of you. So today we are going to talk about canceling an election, how you do it, why you would do it, when you would do it, and then we're going to get into signature verification for those of you who are going to have your elections in April be conducted as mail ballot elections. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. I am going to ask that you uh, type in your questions as they come up and we will just take care of all of that at the very end. And with uh, my technical help here, uh, we're going to do a live demo of the Secretary of State's website so you can see exactly what you need to do for signature verification. So having done that, let's get started. Okay, so when, how, and why do you cancel an election? Okay, first of all, you must have adopted an ordinance, and the ordinance has two parts. The main purpose of the ordinance deals with how you work with people who want to be write-in candidates. And in addition to that, the ordinance also includes a provision that allows you to cancel the election. And these are the requirements that need to be, or the provisions that need to be in that ordinance. First of all, the only time you can cancel election is when the only matter before voters is the election of officers. So for those of you in, in April, if all you're doing is uh, voting on who, on people who are running for office and you don't have any ballot questions or ballot issues uh, on, your, on your ballot in April, then you may cancel your election under the right circumstances. The other thing that the ordinance has to include is a statement that says that at the close of business on the 64th day before the day of the election, there are not more candidates than offices to be filled, including persons who file affidavits of intent to be a write-in candidate. And we'll talk about these affidavits here in a little bit. So not more candidates than offices to be filled. So that means that if you have 
three offices to be filled and you have three candidates and you have this ordinance in place and you've dealt with write-in candidates, you can go ahead and cancel the election. And that's true even if you have just two or even one candidate, but there are not more candidates than offices to be filled. So if these conditions exist, then you can cancel the election, you do it by the adoption of a resolution and you declare the candidates elected. And let me say that even though you are doing, you are adopting the resolution and declaring the candidates elected well before the date of your April election, you cannot swear them in until after the election, the date the election would have been held because the existing council and board members need to have the opportunity to fill out the remainder of their terms. Okay, so not to uh, beat a dead horse, except I'm going to, is that no election can be canceled without having adopted such an ordinance. My guess is that the, the vast majority of municipalities in Colorado have adopted this ordinance because this provision has been in Title 31 for many, many years. Okay, but if you don't have an ordinance, you can't cancel the election. And in addition, if you don't have an ordinance, and remember part of it deals with what you do with writing candidates, is that you have to provide the opportunity for persons to become writing candidates at any time prior to the election. With the ordinance, you state that somebody who wants to be a write-in candidate has to file a written affidavit. And there's no form that needs to be completed. They can simply send you a letter that says, I, Karen Goldman, uh, have determined that I wish to be a write-in candidate in the April 2018 municipal election. It's signed, it's notarized, that's all you need. However, without the ordinance, nobody has to sign this, uh, submit an affidavit of intent. They can just go around your community and say, write me in, write me in, write me in, and then you have to count their name. You have to have them, uh, you have to give them the opportunity to serve as writing candidates. No election can be canceled in part, and what that means is if you have something on the ballot and you have candidates up for election, even if you have the same number of candidates as you have positions available to be elected, the fact that you have something on the ballot means that you can't just vote on that and cancel the, the candidate part of the election. So I, I hope that's clear. If not, go ahead and ask me questions about it. And the notice of canceling the election needs to be published in your newspaper, and it's posted in each polling place that you would normally have set up for your election, and it might be your town hall or your, you know, your municipal building or wherever it is, and in not less than one other public place. And I've given you the statutory citation for that. Now let's talk about this note. And I'm basically gonna repeat what I said before. So if you have this ordinance, even if you don't cancel the election and you hold the election, and we'll talk about why you might not have to, why you won't cancel the election, the names written on the ballot do not have to be counted and made a part of the vote abstract. So let me explain what that means. When somebody files a notice of intent to be a write-in candidate and they submit it to you, then every time their name or even a facsimile of their name shows up on the ballot, that is a vote that has to be counted. But you know, some people will write in their own name. They might write in Arnold Schwarzenegger, I always use Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Mickey Mouse, or Donald Duck, or whatever. And if you have the ordinance requiring the notice of intent, any name other than the person whose name appears who filed an, a notice of intent, those names do not have to be counted at all, and they're not gonna show up on your abstract of votes. But if you don't have the ordinance, any name that somebody writes in has to show up. So you're gonna show 40 votes for candidate A and 36 votes for candidate B and seven votes for Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
So in order to keep your ballot clean, it's a great idea to have this ordinance. Okay, so you've canceled your election and you find out that you actually have vacancies in office once you cancel the election. And the vacancy would occur when you have fewer candidates running than you have positions available. Let me say that again. Vacancies will occur after you cancel the election when you have fewer candidates who ran than you have positions available. So let's deal first of all with the situation where you have the same number of candidates as you have full-time offices to be voted on. And I've highlighted full-time offices because you deal with shortened terms differently. So when you have the same number of candidates as you have full-term offices to be voted on, then all you do is you declare by resolution each candidate shall be elected to the full term. And you swear them in after the election, the date for the election has passed. Okay. Now, when you have fewer candidates than you have the number of full term positions, you have a vacancy. You have a vacancy in office. So after you pass your resolution declaring those candidates elected, then what you do is you go ahead and you fill the vacancy in accordance with state statute. And for statutory towns and statutory cities, the procedure is the same. You either appoint someone within a certain time frame, or if you can't, if you haven't appointed somebody within a certain time frame, then you are obligated you shall have an election. So obviously, the way to avoid having a special election is to do whatever it is you can to get somebody appointed by the remainder of your governing body. And so what some people do is, well, they advertise. They'll advertise in their newspaper or in their water bill or on their website or however it is that they will advertise. And they'll ask for nominations. Um, or, or applications, people who apply, they decide they want to run for office. Sometimes what will happen is they will go back to a prior election and they'll go find the person who ran for office but didn't get elected and find out if that person is still interested and then they will go ahead and appoint them. There's no one way that a, an appointment needs to be made. Um, the only thing that I would strongly suggest is that whatever it is you do, you make sure that a lot of people have the information that there is a vacancy. And so, you, you know, in, in this contentious election environment, and I've heard from a lot of clerks that their elections are real contentious this year, you want to make sure that you are as transparent and as fair and equitable as possible. All right. Now, moving on. Okay, so let's say for those of you who have four year overlapping terms, and this is only dealing with these municipalities which have four year overlapping terms. So here's what happens, and this is really important, and I think this is very confusing for an awful lot of people. Um, so if somebody is appointed to fill a position that becomes vacant because somebody resigned um, during the, the midterm, the way the statute reads is that they serve until the next regular election. And the next regular election will be one of two things. If they are appointed in the first two years of a four year term, then they will run in the next election and the person elected would fill the unexpired term or the remaining two years. And we'll, we'll get to this here, more information on that in just a moment. If a person is appointed to fill a vacancy 
after two years, in other words, in the last two years, sometime in the last two years of a four-year term, then the, at the next election, that term would normally be up so that that position would be, the person who won would be available to serve a four-year term. It is absolutely critical that when you are appointing someone to fill a vacancy and when you are canceling the election, that you keep really, really good records as to exactly what happened, because if you don't, you could be in trouble somewhere down the line. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And I'm not going to name names because I can't remember the names. Had, a, had, a, had, an, had an email from somebody where a term of office was from 2010 to 2014. The person who was elected in 2010 resigned and somebody was appointed in late 2011. So 2012 comes along, and um, the way it should have worked and didn't is that that person who filled the vacancy needed to, if he or she still wanted to run, would need to run in the 2012 election, and there would be a shortened term on the ballot in addition to the regular long terms. Well, things fell through the cracks. The person never filed a nomination petition. Nobody realized it. The election went on. The person continued to serve through the end of 2014, then ran for office again in 2014, got reelected, and the question that was asked is, has this person been term limited? Well, the answer to the question is yes. Um, but the real question was, did he serve legally for those last two years? Um, in situations like this, I always refer, to refer the clerk to their municipal attorney and let the attorney solve the issue. Um, I've also had situations in prior elections where following an election, somebody would call me and say, you know, I think we elected somebody who'd been term limited. I only bring these things up as a reminder that it is important to keep really, really good records. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of doing this. I know that when I worked in Aurora, we had a list of who got elected when and when their term was up and when their term limits would be up and those kinds of things. So if you haven't been keeping a list, I would certainly suggest you start now and make sure that whoever follows you keeps that list going. All right, so let's talk about a situation after you've canceled the election or when there is a vacancy where you have both full-term and short-term positions to be filled. First of all, candidates cannot decide at the time that they are circulating nomination petitions which term they wish to serve in. In other words, they can't say, well, I, I want to serve a full term or, or I want to serve the shortened term. That's not how it works. Um, the way that it works is the longer term goes to the persons who got the most votes and the shortened term goes to the person who got the least number of votes. So because this is the way you determine who you, you have to go by votes, who gets the longer and who gets the shorter, if you have an election in which you are voting on, let's say, three full terms and one shortened term, and you have four candidates, technically and legally, you cannot cancel the election because if you cancel the election, the voters can't determine who gets what position. Now, having said that, and this is my non-legal opinion about this, I think that if you could get all the candidates 
who are on the ballot, who have been certified to the ballot, to agree to some kind of drawing, whether it be straws or numbers or something, sort of like how you do to get their names on the ballot, the order you get their names on the ballot. And if they can all agree that the I'll call it the short straw gets the shorter term and the long straws get the longer term. Then, with the approval of your attorney, I think you may be able to cancel the election. And that way, what happens is you save some money um, and you don't have to have, um, you don't have to go through the provisions of an election. So, um, I think, and I did pretty well here, I think that this is all that I have on canceling the election. So if you've got questions, I'm going to give you a few minutes for anybody to write, not, I'm not a few minutes, I'll give you a minute or so to write out your questions and we're going to take care of it before we move on to signature verification. And I'm going to take a drink of water here. Um, yeah, actually what we can do is, let's see if we've got any questions and if we do, we'll go ahead and answer them now. No. Nope. Karen is just a very thorough presenter. <laughs> when I don't trip over myself. Well, we don't have any questions now, so just make sure we're going to make sure. Oh, oh, we got one. All right. All right. And I have to have Lisa read them, read me the questions. That's what here. I'm here for. Yeah. If someone shows up at the polls with a write-in, do I ask for an affidavit? The affidavit of um, intent to be a write-in candidate must be submitted to you on the 60, no later than the 65th day before the day of the election. Because remember, it's on the 64th day before the day of the election that you can cancel the election if you have the ordinance and if you have the same number of candidates as you have, or no more, if you have the same number or fewer candidates, including writing candidates, as you do have positions to be voted on. So that's the long way of saying no. If somebody shows up on election day with an affidavit of intent to be a writing candidate, it is way too late. The deadline is the 65th day, no later than the 65th day prior to the day of the election. Excuse me, I have only one person running for mayor. Can I leave him off of the ballot? I would say no. I would say no. Um, that you you can't you can't do that. Um, it's um, all people. Even if a, even if somebody is unopposed, I think. And the only way you could you could, let me let me back up. The only way you could leave him off the ballot is if you cancel the entire election. People are expecting to vote for mayor, and even though there's only one candidate, I would strongly suggest you keep that one candidate on the ballot. And you got what? Another week, like almost another week, before the nomination petitions are due. Next question: Do you know where it is in Colorado Revised Statute? It speaks to full and short-term elections. The um, um, not specifically, but I can give you the approximation. It's Title 31, Article 4. Um, Article 4 deals with, with four-year overlapping terms, and that's where it talks about the you, you voting on the shortened term and voting on the full term. That's the best I could do off the top of my head. It's pretty good, Karen. <laughs> If we haven't passed an ordinance that would allow us to cancel the election, can we do that in the next couple of meetings and then cancel it? Absolutely, as long as you do it before 64 days before the day of the election. If your municipality has adopted an ordinance requiring the write-in affidavit and none have been submitted, must you have the write-in space on your printed ballots? Uh, I, you know, I think that you, if, or let me, re, let's see, let's read the question again. Sure. If, if you've passed an ordinance. 
Um, if your municipality has adopted an ordinance requiring the write-in affidavit and none have been submitted, must you have the write-in space on your printed ballot? You know, I would say no. I would, I would say no. I know, I know there is a provision in state statute that speaks about, you know, for each position you have to have a write-in. But I think that that was a provision that was probably in law prior to the requirement to have an affidavit of intent. And, and I, I remember when we, when we put this in, in law because we wanted to eliminate all the Mickey Mouses and Arnold Schwarzeneggers mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So I would say no. If you got the ordinance, you don't have to have the write-in. If you have no one running for mayor, do you appoint the mayor position? It depends on, um, you'd have to, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go back to um, the state statute and for the statutory towns to talk about vacancies in the position of mayor. And that's something that off the top of my head, I don't, uh, I can't answer. However, the answer can be found. Again, this is in uh, uh, Title 31. I believe it's somewhere in Article 4. If the election is canceled, do I do a separate resolution for each candidate that is being elected or put them all on the same resolution? You can put them all on the same resolution. There's no need to do individual resolutions. That's just kind of a waste of time and money. Great. Well, that was the last question. All right. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we're going to move on now to the big one, signature verification. And uh, we'll come back if anybody thinks of any questions that they might have regarding canceling the election. We can deal with them at the end. All right. A couple of things you need to know. First of all, this really is going to be easy. Um, we're going to talk about the procedure. I've got some screenshots that um, I want to show you from the Secretary of State website. And then my intention, being the non-techie that I am, is to do a live demo of how this will work. So again, I just want you to believe that it will be easy. Now, having said that, let me say that this could be time consuming, especially for those municipalities with a large number of um, mail ballots that are generally returned in elections. However, um, when the, just, just to give you a little bit of comfort here, when the counties first started signature verification in the county elections, some of them use machines, a lot of them don't, including El Paso County, which is a huge county. And after when the Secretary of State's office surveyed the counties to find out how the signature verification worked, well more than 90% of the signatures were verified on the first pass through. So if you do the procedure the way I am suggesting, I think you'll find that it will go fairly quickly. All right, here we go. All right, signature verification for municipalities um, was adopted, a bill, House Bill um, uh, 1070 was adopted in 2016. And um, this was a situation where there had been a bill regarding signature verification in municipalities that got introduced in, I believe it was 2015. Uh, and for the municipalities, it was surprise, we didn't know anything about it. And um, the CML and CMCA, we were able to go to the sponsor and we were able to get him to uh, kill his bill or agree to having his bill killed. Uh, with the idea that we would come back and meet with him and help him develop a bill that would work. And when I say work, what we meant was where it was not going to re require a whole lot of um, fancy equipment, wouldn't require barcodes, wouldn't require scanners, wouldn't require a whole lot of extra municipal judges. The sponsor agreed. We came back in 2016. Uh, we passed uh, they passed the bill. We asked for a couple of years uh, so that we could implement it. And between 2016 uh, and now, we have worked with the Secretary of State's office 
to create a procedure under the uh, a, a tab actually under the DEO designated election official lookup that would allow you to check signatures again without a whole lot of fancy equipment and extra staff and extra money. So as you know, municipal clerks do not have full access to SCORE. SCORE is the statewide voter registration database. What we do have through SCORE is what's called DEO, Designated Election Official Access. It is a read-only lookup. I think many clerks have already used it. Um, in order to do signature verification, you will need to obtain DEO access, and you will do that by submitting an application with the Secretary of State's office, and I'm going to walk you through how that is done. All right. So basically, here are the procedures. Um, signature verification is the first step once you've received and checked in your ballots. The verification requires three election judges. And we'll, in, on the next slide, we talk about what each judge does. I want to um, have you look at the third bullet, which I have highlighted because this is extremely important. Some of you know this already. Thank you, Randy, for uh, your answer this morning. The signature tab on the DEO access is permanent. It, it will always be there. However, you cannot use the actual signature, and by signature in this case, we mean how you write your name in script or print or however you write your name. You cannot use that portion of the DEO access to either qualify or disqualify signatures on anything other than mail ballot return envelopes. In other words, you cannot use them on nomination petitions. You cannot use them on initiative, referendum, or recall petitions, charter amendment petitions. It is prohibited by law. And um, in the past, I know some of you have been getting some pushback from your municipal officials. It is against the law. Now, that doesn't mean that in the future, we're going to be required to do something like that. But for right now, the only time you can compare signatures is on mail ballot return envelopes and not on absentee ballot envelopes that are used in polling place elections. Mail ballot return envelopes only. I don't want to make sure I promised the Secretary of State's office I would make a big deal out of it. So hopefully that's exactly what I have done. Okay, so when you're looking at signatures, these are the kinds of things that you're looking at. And, and, and when we get to a real signature, which will be my signature, you'll, you'll see what we're talking about. First of all is the slant of the name. Is it vertical? Is it slant to the right? Some people are left-handed, slanted to the left. The slant of the name. That's one of the elements that very easy to track uh, on the signatures. The size or the scale of the signature. Do some people write really, really teeny tiny or are they ginormous? So you look at the size or the scale of the signature, the individual letter characteristics. And by that, what I mean is, um, do they dot their I or do they put a little heart or a smiley face? Um, how do they cross the T? Is it on a slant? Is it straight? You know, if it's on a slant, which way does it angle? Um, are the T's kind of open? Um, there's all kinds of things and I've got some, I've got, my signature has a couple of individual letter characteristics that you'll see. And then how the letters are connected top to bottom. And by that is, um, do you connect all the letters to itself? For example, on my signature, you'll see that my K is not really attached to my A in my first name. But these are the kinds of things that you can look at. The Secretary of State's office on their website 
has a manual, which you are welcome to look at, that goes into this a little further and actually has a great little test um, where what they've done is they've asked staff to write the word state. I think it's a total of 50 times, and then you, you're asked to try to pair them up. And this is a good training uh, material for your uh, election judges, and please be aware that you are required to train your judges in how to verify signatures. So this is one situation where the municipal clerk should not serve as an election judge. I, I never think it's really a good idea to do that, but specifically when you're doing a mail ballot election, I think it's very important for the municipal judge to, main, to be kind of the uh, maintain oversight and management of the verification process, be able to answer questions and not do the actual signature verification him or herself. All right, so here's how it goes. The first pass goes to one election judge. The election judge having access to DEO, to the having the DEO access, and let me say that every individual election judge probably will, not probably, will need to sign up for his or her own DEO access. And I've alerted the Secretary of State's office that the, the applications are coming and be aware that the, uh, appli that the DEO access is good for 90 days. After 90 days, you can renew um, your application, but it's good for 90 days. So I suggest waiting a week or two before you apply to get your DEO access. And the reason I say that is because for those of you who have UOCAVA voters, and those of you who, who may have questions about the signatures, and we'll get to that in a minute in terms of what you do, you want to make sure you continue to have the access at least eight days after the day of the election so you can check the, the signatures for any additional ballots that may come in. So I would wait a week uh, and go ahead and get your, your access. All right, back to the process. So the first judge takes a look at the return envelope calls up the name on the DEO access, compares the two, and if it is in the mind of the judge that they are the same signatures, that ballot envelope is set aside and you continue to count your ballots as you normally would in, your, in a mail ballot election. However, if that first judge says, mm, I don't know, I don't think this quite matches, then what you do is you send it to the next two judges who work as a team. They look at the, they eyeball this as a team and they say one of two things. They either say, I agree with the first election judge that this, these signatures don't match. And then there's a procedure that happens. I'll talk about that in a minute. Or both judges say, no, I think these signatures match and then that ballot is put aside to be counted, or one election judge says, I think it matches, and the other says, I don't think it does, and as we often do, we err on the side of the voter, then that ballot gets to be counted. And I'm gonna go through that again as I, after this particular slide. Okay, so. First judge says, signatures match, ballot is counted. First, first judge says, signatures don't match. I'm going to send it on to the two additional election judges. And if they agree that the, if, if they um, disagree with the first judge and they think the signatures do match, it can be counted. If they, uh, if they, dis if they, I'm sorry, if they, agree with the first judge that they don't match, then what happens is you give the voter a chance to say, I actually voted in your election and I turned my ballot in. And there is a letter that will be sent and a form that they fill out. And if you get the form back, then you count the ballot. And let me say that the, um, the, letter and the form uh, 
are from the Secretary of State's office. And what I am going to do is I'm going to adapt it uh, with their permission for use by municipalities. And we will, we will put it on the listserv. We'll get it on the CMC, CML website. And I'll make sure that it goes through the CMCA website as well. So you're going to have it. Um, and so what you do is if you determine that, if, that the signatures don't match, you send the letter within three days of that determination and no later than two days after the election day. And why are these dates different? Because remember, you can start processing mail ballots 15 days before the day of the election. And you're going to send a letter and a form that they fill out. And if the form is returned no later than eight days after the day of the election, the ballot can be counted erring on the side of inclusion this of the voter. And this is the exact same pre procedures that the counties use in the election, mail ballot elections that they um, manage. So we're doing exactly what the counties do. So hopefully that will give you some, some comfort in that. Okay. I'm sure there'll be questions about this. We'll deal with that. All right. So Again, if the second set of judges cannot agree on whether they match, one says yes, one says no, we err on the side of matching and the ballots can be counted. So any ballot, any signature that is sent to those second election judges, you have to put in a log certain information. And then this becomes a record. And basically what you're doing is you're documenting what you did. So first of all, you're putting in the name and the ID number of the elector. And you'll see that you can get the ID number from the DEO access. You're going to identify the final resolution. Counted, wasn't counted. Letter sent to voter, certain date. Then if the letter was sent on a certain date, then it would be letter returned on a certain date. And then the signature of the judges responsible for that resol for that determination and for that resolution. And so my thought would be that when you hire these election judges, you, you rotate them so that everybody gets a chance to be on the team of two and everybody gets to be the first person to make that decision. Now, I know that sounds scary, but it really isn't. Remember that 90 plus percent of the ballots when compared to the signature in the DEO, in the, in the database and score um, are going to match up. So before we go on, that kind of raises the question of when do I bring in my judges? And I've always said in the mail ballot election is that you bring your judges in when you need them. But now with signature verification, these are my ideas and that's all they are. They are my ideas and you're going to have to judge for yourself when you're going to bring them in, depending upon how many ballots you send out and how many ballots you expect to be returned. And just because you send out a thousand ballots, as you all know, doesn't mean a thousand ballots are going to come back in. So here's my thought. You can start processing the ballots 15 days before the day of the election. Um, I would use the early days, the close to that 15th day before the day of the election as your training period. You might get, you know, maybe a couple of dozen ballots back, maybe a couple of hundred ballots back. And that's when you work with your judges to go through this process so that they become comfortable with that process. And maybe that first day they're, you know, they're around for an hour, a couple hours, and then that's it. And you know how ballots come in. When you first send ballots out, right after you send them out, there's a pretty good response immediately. Then it kind of slows down for a while. And then as it gets closer and closer to the election, more and more ballots come in. And then as everybody knows, you get really slammed on election day. So it would be my thought that on that Friday before the, for the election, you make sure that anything that has come in has had their signature verified or not, and you've gone through all those other steps that you need to take before you actually count the ballots or record the results. And that on Monday, you, you do the best you can to deal with everything you got on Monday, and then obviously on Tuesday, 
election day, you do the same thing. And remember, the election results that you post the night of the election after the polls have closed are unofficial results. So even if you're not through counting all your ballots at 7 o'clock, whatever you have counted, you can release. In fact, what I always tell people is that in county elections, that first result that you get at 701 is probably the bulk of everything that has come in prior to election day and might even include part of election day. Your official results do not show up until the canvas is done, and that's going to be one of the subjects for the next webinar in March. Okay, moving on. So you know how in a household when people are voting their ballot and they're having discussions, sometimes what you get is one family member's ballot um, in the wrong envelope where the husband signs the wife's return envelope or the son signs the father's return envelope or something like that. So there is a provision just because um, the signature does not match who's the, the, the if, if you put the name on the envelope, the signature does not match the name on the envelope. If everything else is valid, in other words, the signatures match, then that particular ballot can be counted. Let me say that again. If I return my ballot in my husband's envelope and sign my name, as long as my name matches what's in the DEO access, then my, that ballot will count. Confidential voter information will not be, you will not find any information on a confidential voter in SCORE. It will be, everything will be blank. You'll have the name, but there's no address, there's no nothing, and there definitely is no signature. Now, who is a confidential um, voter? Well, some confidential voters are members of our public safety forces, police and fire who don't want anybody to know where they live. Um, sometimes they're victims of some kind of crime or abuse. And uh, we also got a lot of people who wanted to be confidential voters uh, when um, uh, there was a request sent out nationwide for voter registration database for a now defunct federal uh, election committee. So if you come up, if there's a name, you have somebody's name uh, on the envelope and there's no information, then you contact your county clerk and they will be able to help you out. The DEO access under the signature tab will list up to three signatures on the ballot. And they're going to be the three most recent signatures. I'm sorry, not on the ballot that they have in the database. There will, except for confidential voters, there will always be at least one signature. And that will come from their voter registration form. So there will at least be one and will be a maximum of three. And there's a, a website. I've talked to staff at the Secretary of State's office if you have any questions or problems with the access. Now, to be honest, when I signed up, um, I because I use Chrome on my computer at home, I had trouble filling out some of the information. But if you have any issues, um, you can just contact the Secretary of State's office at that website. Okay, so um, three most recent signatures. You apply to the Secretary of State's office. Uh, usernames will expire in 90 days, but they can be renewed. And then the last bullet, this is important, you'll see on the application form, and when we go live, you'll see this, that they ask you to list either, it's interesting, the charter provision or the, or the, the, the statute or the authority for that, re, that obligates you to check signatures. And since nobody has this in their charter that I'm aware of, 
this it will be the citation that you put in. You just put in 31-10-910.3, which is the statute regarding signature verification. And you just put that in the form, and that is what's acceptable. OK, now, it's small here, but I wanted to give you some screenshots about what you will find when you go to um, the Secretary of State's office. So the first thing, the first thing, what the first thing we've got here is this page where it's the voter lookup login. And you'll see voter ID and password. Once you get your ID and your password, that is where you that's where you're going to type it in in order to be able to access anybody who is in SCORE. But you'll notice at the bottom under search, it says request for access. And I don't have my glasses on, so I don't have the exact language. But you can see it's a link there. And we'll show you live here. In order to request access, that's where you go. You just click on that. And then this is what the, this, the, so, and then you would, you would click on that. And we'll show you what the form looks like live. But now you've got your DEO access, you've typed in your, your, um, your username, and you've typed in your password, and now you want to look someone up. So you'll notice at the top that you, it tells you that you enter a voter ID number, two letters of the person's last name, and it's the first two letters of the person's last name or the date of birth. Well, on a mail ballot envelope, Maybe if you're doing scanning, and I know a couple of municipalities do, they will have the voter ID number on the return envelope. Most of you will not. None of you will have a birth date on the return envelope. So what you're going to do is you're going to type in the person's name. So I've typed in my name, Karen Goldman. I could easily just have done Karen G.O or just G-O. And then down in the address, and this is what is really going to help you out, and you'll understand this when we go live. I have typed in my the digits of my address. And you'll see my whole address comes up here because it populates that way. But if you type in 6558, what I'm doing is I'm narrowing the search parameters. So I'm looking for a Karen Goldman who lives at an address that begins with 6558. And you go down to the bottom, and you see where it says exact or begins with. And this is absolutely critical. You always, always, always highlight begins with. And then just below this, which is not on the screen, you hit search. And here's what you come up with. There I am. Yes, Karen Beth, that's me. My mother only called me Karen Beth when she was mad at me. But So you'll see. So here's the information. Let's look at the information. Here's my voter ID number. Now, if my signature was in question, that voter ID number would need to go on that form that we mentioned. There's my date of registration, um, my the fact that I'm an active voter. There's my party affiliation, which, of course, is irrelevant in a municipal election. Uh, and then the date of affiliation to the party. And you'll notice my date of registration is after affiliation, and that's because in 2007 I changed addresses and I moved. But there I am. Above my name, you'll see four tabs. Um, the voter overview, which I just described. The ballot information, and I'll show you these when we go when we go live. The ballot information basically is when the ballot is actually sent out by the county. It'll say the ballot has been sent, the ballot has been received. I don't think they use the word received, but the ballot has been received. And you know all county elections now are mail ballot elections. The third tab is the district um, election. And basically what this is, is information on all the things I get to vote on by virtue of the fact that I'm an active voter um, within at this, at this, at a particular address. And then finally, the last tab is signatures. And here they are. Here are my signatures. 
the most recent. I think the second one, I think these are all for my income taxes because I think one of them, no, I think my driver's license might be too old, but um, there's a, and you'll notice they're all pretty similar. Now, remember when we talked about um, things to look at at the um, when you're checking signatures? So the, my slant is pretty vertical uh, in, in every single case. Um, it's hard to tell, but the K is not attached to the A. Um, I don't, you know, and but the big defining pieces of my signature are the way I do G of my last name. It's like a small G, except it's big. Take a look at the D and how the D looks. The big part of the D kind of slants to the left. And then my N, the Larry last letter, my last name kind of tails off. So those would be the kinds of things that you would look at in when you're looking at the signatures. So I think, yep, yeah, that's it. So now what we're going to do with my technical assistance, we're going to go live to the Secretary of State's website and show you how this works. All right, this is the homepage for the Secretary of State's website. You type in Colorado Secretary of State, that's how I got there. And what we want to do is we want to go here to elections and voting. All right, you click on elections and voting, and then you go to voters. All right, now, manage my registration. We want to find my registration. You want to, this is a way you can find your registration or yeah, we want to we want to go see where it says election administration administrator login. And here is request voter. Now this is this is what the form looks like. This is I didn't have this on my slides. And you'll notice here municipal. We want to go to municipal. And just kind of whistle here for a moment. Hopefully we'll get to it. It's thinking. But what I want to do is you fill out this form online. And I want to show you what the form looks like. Oh, is it here? Here we go. All right. So here is here is the form. Your contact information. It's pretty simple. Signature verification. And this is the box where you fill in that statute. You click this. You fill in the statute. You acknowledge. You just fill this out, you submit the form, and the next thing you know, you get an email from the Secretary of State's office giving you your username and password, and then telling you that it's good for 90 days and you have to renew it, and if you have any questions, who to contact, and that's it. It is easy peasy. All right, so let's go back here. Okay, so once you've got your username and password, and I'm going to type mine in if I can do this. You'll see how bad a typist I am here. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you. Whoop, it helps if I can spell. Hold on. And sometimes it takes me a couple of times to get in here. Okay, so here we are. Let me go back to close this at the bottom here. So remember, voter registration, that same form. So now watch what I'm going to do. I'm just going to type in my name. Whoops. I'm going to try to type in my name here. This is always the embarrassing part when I do these uh, trainings because I'm trying to see what I'm doing here. Everybody's laughing, I hope. At me. <laughs> I know. No. I do, yeah. No. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to type in my name. And I'm not going to type in my address. And I'm just going to go down. And I'm going to hit begins with. And hit that search button. And there's five of me. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. There's five of me. So there are three of them in Jefferson County, two in La Plata, 
I don't know which one is, well, I do know which one is me, but you might not know which one is me. And so you're going to spend a whole lot of time clicking on these names and going to the signature page and all this kind of stuff to figure out which one is which. But as I said, if you go back and type in the information, including, and again, begins with, let's see if I, if I have to go back and fill in my name again. Yeah, this time let's do this. Let's just do G-O, all right? And let's see what happens here. There I am, look at that. Wow. See how that, all right. So now we're gonna go back to this screen. We've seen the voter details. This is your ballot information. And then if there had been a ballot that they'd send out, it would talk about the status. Here are all the place, the things that I get to vote on. All the districts and everything else. I'm in Lakewood, hi Margie, hi Michelle. <laughs> I'm in Ward 3. Um, I'm in all these special districts. Here's my state house and here's my major, you know, precinct number. And then here we are back to those signatures. Pretty cool, huh? We have to thank the Secretary of State's office on this. So that's it. And so now it's time for questions. So type them in. And while you're doing that, I do want to reference the um, webinar that Karen mentioned, uh, Wednesday, March 14th, again, new to one, Wednesday, March 14th, it's going to be on canvassing and any final election questions you have. Registration is open, cml.org, under um, events or trainings, um, and the instructions will provide you with my email link, this is Lisa, to send any questions that you have in advance that you'll like Karen to talk about and certainly you'll be able to ask questions online as well. Right, so in addition to canvassing the votes, what this is going to be is an open forum, any kind of last minute questions, any unanswered questions, any issues that you had, that kind of thing. It'll be, it'll be an open kind of Q&A. All right, so let's see what we've got here. Let's start from the top. Should the first election judge keep a log of every signature they verify? No, only the ones that, they, that they've sent on to the next two judges. About how long does it take the Secretary of State to process the application form for access to SCORE? Um, a day. How does this work when you have a hand scanner? Does it take you right to their registration page? I don't believe it does um, because we, again, this is the only way to access the signatures. We, even with a scanner, I don't think you can get into their, uh, their database because it contains a lot of personal private information and we are not authorized as of yet to directly access that. What if your charter does not require the signature verification? Do we then just check the acknowledgement box and not signature boxes? Um, no charter does. So what you do is you type in that state statute that I referenced, 31-10-910.3. Do all judges need to have DEO access? Do they just, or do they just use the clerk login? Um, in the past, when I've, received, when I've had DEO access, I have been instructed not to share my DEO access with anyone, so I think it's a good idea for every judge to sign up individually, and one of the things you can do is um, you, as the clerk, can cancel the um, DEO access of your election judges um, once the election is over and you, you don't need to have them do that anymore just by contacting that elections at sos.state.co.us. Is there a certification of judges for signature verification? Um, whoever asked that question, I'm not sure what you mean by certification. Um, if, if you mean do they have to have like uh, training and pass a test or anything like that, the answer is no. But if I haven't answered the question, please be more specific. Can you go over where you go from the elections and voting page again? Sure, okay. So um, you wanna play around. So from the elections and voting page, you'll go to voters. And then from voters, 
you go to find my registration and at the bottom of that that's where you can apply for your DEO access and once you have your DEO access you will go to that same page where it says request DEO access or whatever it says and then that's when you will type in your username and password and then you will get to the point where you can look up anybody um, uh, that's in SCORE. Does the board have to do a resolution to designate the clerk as the DEO? And if so, when should that be done? Well, you know, most, most uh, I don't think it's a requirement. Most municipalities do um, adopt a resolution uh, and you definitely want to have it done in advance of the election. And my suggestion would be that um, to prevent you from having to do it election after election after election, just do a blanket will be, you know, DEO for all elections conducted in the town of whatever. What if my judges want to spend a day just verifying signatures and then lock up ballots to count on another day? No problem, but remember, you're in charge, so you're in charge of the process. Can a home rule city pass an ordinance to not require signature verification? Um, at your own peril. <laughs> and, I say, and I say that, first of all, the, the answer is yes. As a home rule municipality, you can, you can do that. Um, the, the purpose for signature verification, and you know, I, I, I know some of you were groaning because you've groaned to me before about what a pain this is going to be and could be expensive, and I, I get it. I really get it. However, think of all the people who still think mail ballot elections are fraudulent, and they're out there. Believe me, they are out there, and not only are they out there, they are down at the Capitol. They're down at the Capitol, and so by having signature verification, basically you're saying we have nothing to hide. And we're, we always have run a good election, um, and we're going to continue to do that. However, if your, your board, your council, as a home rule municipality, decides to opt out, you have the authority to do that. Has anyone used the machine that does the initial signature verification from ES and S? I believe they said Colorado Springs uses it. This person is curious how effective it is and if it is worth using. They will have at least 15,000 ballots to verify. Um, if you think Colorado Springs has done it, I suggest you contact Sarah Johnson directly and get that information. Uh, did I understand that we could not use this to verify signatures on polling place absentee ballots? Are we to use it to verify signatures on a mail ballot absentee ballot? Um, ab mail ballot, uh, here's, here's the thing. First of all, this is for mail ballot elections only. So if you're conducting a polling place election, absentee ballots and mail ballots, although they look the same, they're, they're not. So, in t so, so if you're having a polling place election, you have absentee ballots, no signature verification, mail ballot election only. In terms of absentee ballots on a mail ballot election, you're not going to have that many. My, my suggestion, and this is not a legal opinion, is you just go ahead and do it. Is there a specific log out there to use for deficiency? I will be um, creating one that you can use. And, and please, when you get the form letter, the form that the, the um, disqualified voter needs to send back, and the actual log, don't just use it verbatim, I guess, or as written. If you need to adopt or if you need to adapt it to your municipality, please, please, please go ahead and do it. Is that it? I will give you another minute or so. Um, that's all the questions that have come in thus far. I do want to plug our annual conference. It's going to be, believe it or not, June 19th through 22nd in Vail. If you or one of your elected officials or colleagues would like to apply for the CML scholarship, those are online at cml.org under annual conference. Those are due February 9th. So you want to get that application in uh, when you can, as soon as possible, because we will have a limited number of scholarships that we can, that we can give out. Well, I don't see any more questions. Um, right. So, you know, as I say it all the time, uh, you know how to get in touch with me. Um, I'll be out there on the listserv. You want to contact me directly, that would, that would be great. Um, you know, statutory ta towns always wind up being the beta testers. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, I apologize. Mm -hmm. However, uh, this is going to be a great opportunity. I think it's going to work. Um, like anything else, anything new, 
you know, is kind of scary. Oh, we got another question here. If you get two envelopes from the same household with the same signatures, which ballot counts? Neither. Easy enough. But again, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Karen if she can be of assistance with election stuff or anything else. And of course, CML is always here to, to help you out as well. So with that, thank you, Karen. And thank you, everybody, and have a, a great afternoon. Thank you all.